Well, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening. This is uh, Joe DiCarlo, the Vice President of International from the Balanced Scorecard Institute, a company under the Strategy Management Group. And I'm very happy to have you on this webinar today, Seven Competencies to Manage Strategic Performance. Uh, I'll a few couple of things before I turn it over to Randy Rollinson. We uh, have some administrative uh, things we can do down in the chat box. We encourage you to ask questions during this webinar, and we will be saving those to the end because we want to get through the content, which will be about 30, 35 minutes, and then we can devote uh, a very large amount of time to Q&A. So enter your questions. I'll be uh, compiling those, and at the appropriate time at the end, we'll pick up on the Q&A. Randy, turn it over to you. Joe, thank you. Hello, everyone. My name's Randall Rollinson. I'm uh, in process of becoming uh, Senior Vice President of Strategy Management at the Strategy Management Group. I am the co-founder and president of LBL Strategies here in Chicago. I've been doing this sort of work for a long time um, in all kinds of different organizations and all over the world. And in 2010, my co-author and I, Dr. Earl Young, wrote a book called Strategy in the 21st Century. We use that book in our certification program that we run with uh, George Washington University the College of Professional Studies. Uh, I'm the co-founder and current president of the Chicago chapter of the Association for Strategic Planning and have been involved for many, many years in development of ASP certification program. And we're also a registered education provider. And like many, if not all of you, I've spent a, a lot of time in school. So today, we're going to talk about seven different competencies that underpin effective management of strategic performance. Before I do, though, that, before I go into all of these, let me um, pose an argument here, uh, and I'll be brief about it. But my argument is I postulate that uh, management of strategic performance is a function of three primary elements strategic management process, oops, sorry, hit the wrong button, the strategic management process, the competencies, the individual competencies of the team, the leadership team, and then the organizational capabilities. If uh, our strategic management competencies improve, I mean, we can have the best planning process in the world, but we don't have competencies and organizational capabilities, we don't go very far. So my point is, as strategic management competencies improve, so does organizational capabilities. And the stronger we come, become as individuals and small teams of being able to execute the discipline of strategy management, the more likely we're going to be able to measure and manage strategic performance. So now let's turn our attention to the seven competencies, and we'll start with understanding how to become a strategy-focused organization. My experience, I've been doing this over well, a long time now, 30 plus years, and what I found is it all comes down to the people. And strategy is about change, and my experience tells me that people generally don't like to change. If that's the case, we've got a problem right off the bat. So the first and foremost thing I want to emphasize in being able to manage strategic performance is to build in a robust strategy, uh, change management process from the beginning, where we identify who the key stakeholders are that are likely to be impacted by change. We move ahead and understand the, their readiness to change, and then put together a communications change management plan that really helps the organization to move to the next level, as well as helping individuals gain the skills and attitudes they need to successfully turn the corner all the while leveraging what John Cotter has, uh, has made very clear to us for many years now, fundamentals of change management, creating urgency in the beginning and all the way through anchoring that change in the corporate culture. So from the beginning of any strategy management activity, we need to think about change and the people that are going to have to adapt to change. Secondly, strategic management at work. The first slide was all about just doing what it takes to manage the change process. The second is we need to understand that strategy management is a system. We need to think of it as a systems approach. 
a leadership team comes together, develops a strategy, execute their strategy, and over time they measure and evaluate whether it's working, and that feedback informs the entire strategy management system. Fundamental to strategy management actually working is we need some type of information system that feeds the process along the way. Third, and this I refer to more as a, a philosophy, a team-based philosophy. If the all-knowing leader taking us to the promised land ever worked, it certainly doesn't work anymore. The world is too complex. We need to focus on a team of leaders, team-based leadership, working together to develop an effective plan, accurately measure whether it's working as a team, and then working together over time to make the ongoing improvements. Once we are able to accomplish this, we're well on our way to creating a foundation for sustainable growth. The second competency, systematically assessing the external opportunities and threats. I want to start by just uh, defining the term, and I call it environmental assessment. When I use that term, I'm referring to two parts. First is analyzing the environment, and then secondly, evaluating where to focus. We need to analyze what are the key trends at the macro level that are going to impact us, as well as what's going on at the industry level, where our key stakeholders are. Do that analysis, do that due diligence, and then as time moves on, we move into doing the evaluation and selecting the opportunities and threats that best match our capabilities. Part of due diligence, from my perspective, needs, we need to emphasize the courting of stakeholders. And I use the term courting deliberately. Every organization has key stakeholders that have a vested interest in our success or failure. We need to walk in their shoes a bit and assess their situation, listen and learn to them, and then engage them in the strategy process. Once we've done that, once we have a real clear understanding of what our stakeholders need, want, and expect, whether that be customers, suppliers, strategic partners, the local community that we're involved in, we need to stay engaged and continue to listen and then work together to set objectives, win-win objectives. So courting stakeholders, mighty important. When it comes time to do evaluation, we're all familiar. Anyone that's been in this field for two days knows about SWOT analysis. SWOT came to us in the 1970s in work that was done by both Harvard and Stanford. And I want to push back on the analysis part. Now, I look at the SWOT technique as an evaluation technique. And it begins with the opportunities, not the strengths the market, the customers, the needs, they're in the external environment. So I make the argument that we begin by understanding of all the opportunities out there, which are the primary ones that we're going to focus on, and then and only then, what are the strengths we have to build on? What are the weaknesses we need to eliminate? What are the threats we have to manage or mitigate? So we refer this as, as an OTSWI evaluation. I know it doesn't roll off your tongue, but uh, after we've done the analysis, somehow we have to evaluate what we've learned. And this tool is as effective as anything I've ever seen. The third competency, formulating a clear and achievable desired future state. Many years ago, well not many years ago, five or six years ago, um, Howard Rome, uh, David Wilsey, myself, uh, two or three others, um, worked uh, as a team to develop the body of knowledge guide that ASP uses for their certification program. And one of the things that we learned early on is too little emphasis is given to strategic thinking. You know, we jump right to planning and what are the tactics and the budget and time frames and who's responsible, but we don't spend enough time thinking strategically. So if we ultimately want to be clear about our vision, our mission, our goals, our strategies, we need to take the time, understand the environment, what are the opportunities that match with our capabilities. Those are certainly ones we should consider, but to be an organization that ultimately is able to manage performance, I make the argument we need to use one more filter and pick those opportunities that best match with our core competencies and competitive advantage. Once we're clear about that as a team, this is where we need to focus. Now we can move on to formulating strategy, 
and begins with those higher level statements of vision, mission, values, any strategic policies, and then I'm a believer in one or two overarching goal statements, long-term targets of success. Once we know those goals, now we can move on to formulating strategy. One of my favorite authors, and I'm coming back to change just for a moment now, is a woman named Janine Lamarche. She wrote a book several years ago called Changing the Way We Change. And I find this virtually every engagement I've involved in. When I start with a new team, it's kind of like they're all inside an old Victorian house looking out a window, each their own window, and they see reality from their own perspective, but they don't see the big picture. So by doing the environmental assessment work, it levels the information playing field and enables us to clearly define this desired future state. Information enables us to define a clear end state. Once we've done that, then we have to move through what Janine calls the delta. The delta is neither the old way of doing things or the new way of doing things. The delta can be scary, it can be concerning, it can be exciting, but there are many different ways to move through the delta. The fourth competency, think clearly as strategy alternatives are considered and selected. As I mentioned, crossing the delta, many different ways to get from where we are to where we want to go. We always know that there's more than one way to move forward. So we need a strategy. So the first question I ask myself when I'm working with a new team is how are they going to cross the delta? And where is it they need strategy? It's one thing to just say, what's your strategy? I ask a, prime, a, a, a prior question is where do we need strategy? And I refer to those areas where we need strategy as key organizational drivers of success. And what I have up here is just an example. It, it, they depend on every single organization uh, to be able to uh, define that. Uh, I've been doing some work with a tier one automotive company the past several months. And one of the things that I've noticed there in working with them is some of the key trends that they're facing are shifting demographics, uh, millennials, young people were not driving cars as much. Uh, the impact of Uber has really taken down demand. And the folks that are driving cars, they refer to them as Generation C. Uh, whether regardless of your age, it's the, the market is those folks that want to be connected, that at all times want an app, want to be able to reach whoever they need to very efficiently to set up an appointment. So in that situation, a potential goal statement that, uh, that they are considering is, uh, you know, become the service brand of choice. So that's the overall, let's just say for now that that's the overall goal. And in this situation, key drivers of success could be the capacity of their dealers, uh, being able to provide convenient service, uh, staff development, uh, cus having a good repository of customer knowledge, uh, leadership and culture development. So those are examples of key drivers of success in the little scenario I'm painting here. Once we know what those key drivers are, then we have to figure out what are the strategies. So for example, the, the key driver of dealer capacity. Maybe we uh, shorten service time. Uh, maybe we expand the hours of operations. Or maybe we fix it right the first time. These are, these are alternative ways to move forward to become the service brand of choice. Once alternative strategies have been identified, my experience, my instincts, my belief is that we need to run them through three filters. We need to pick strategies that are consistent with the leaders of the organization. It does no good to focus on strategies that leaders aren't behind. We need to take those that are consistent with the leader perceptions and pick the strategies that most likely will drive us towards goal attainment. And then I would further make the argument, we narrow that further to those key strategies, those cross-functional organizational strategies that can bring everyone into the mix. Once we've gone through a thinking process like that, we can actually put together a plan of action to achieve a goal or a goal set. With strategies defined, now the question becomes, how do we translate them into operational terms? 
too often what comes down from the top of the organization is not understood uh, by the folks who have to implement the strategy. Maybe they didn't have anything to do with creating the strategy, or it's just too high and too far removed. I mean, what does operational excellence actually mean? So that translation needs to occur uh, on a timely basis. And the way we do that is translate higher level strategy into operational, strategic operational objectives. And this has been around, smart objectives have been around since the uh, 80s and the 90s. There's nothing really new here, but we need a specific, measurable, attainable, somebody responsible, time-framed objectives. Uh, I was doing a little research the other day, and I found a, a new methodology called OKRs. Um, that stands for objectives and key results. Uh, John Doerr uh, brought, uh, learned about this and work he was doing with Intel and took it to, to Google. And what they've modified, the SMART objectives now, instead of having attainable objectives, more aspirational. But regardless of what model you use, we need a good set of strategic objectives that everybody can understand what we're trying to accomplish. Competency number five, practice a disciplined approach to reaching performance targets. We know from work that Kaplan and Norton did uh, back in the beginning that strategy is not about managing initiatives. We have an objective, an initiative, and then with the measures. Rather, strategy is about managing the accomplishment of objectives, and we need indicators that tell us where we're making progress. We call these strategic measures. So we need measurements at this level, and then certainly there will be initiatives and project level measures. And the project level measures feed the higher order. But understanding we're not trying to measure out activities, we're trying to measure the outcomes that we seek. These strategic measures, they're called different things. We refer to them here as key performance indicators. A KPI, is, it's a measure for sure, and we need to have the data, and it helps us quantify, are we making progress towards the outcome that we seek, so that we can, in fact, manage strategic performance. The whole purpose here, we do measurement so we can manage whether we're on the right track. I want to talk about KPIs in two different ways now, one in terms of the phases to develop them, and the other in terms of the levels of performance measures. So phases of performance management. Obviously, we have to define the desired outcome. We have to determine the most appropriate KPIs, the vital few versus the trivial many, agree on a level of performance, a targeted result that we're seeking. We have to collect, evaluate, and, and make sure we report the data in such a way that it can be transformed into performance information. These are the steps every time we go through to actually build out uh, performance measures. In terms of levels, we do a lot of work here in the agriculture industry. I'm a farm boy from southern Illinois. I've been doing work with agriculture commodity groups for 25 years now. So I want to use just a little case now. There's an organization here in Illinois, a mission-driven organization. It's called the Illinois Soybean Association. They represent 40,000 soybean farmers in the state of Illinois. And their organization has established a goal that by 2020, there will be 600 million bushels of Illinois soybeans being used somewhere. Right now, they're about at the 475 level. This is the first level of performance management. Actually, are we measuring and manage, are we making progress towards this ultimate goal? Now, to achieve that goal, they have a small set of objectives. And in this case, I'm just going to pick one, is to increase yield and return on investment. Once we know what that outcome is, now we begin saying, okay, what is it that we need to measure that will tell us whether we're making progress? And the way the state of Illinois is broken up, it's into eight different di districts. But District 4 is the primary growing area in the state. So that's what we're going to track. We're going to set targets and outcome for, in that particular region of the state, uh, what is yield? How many bushels per acre? There are also things that we'd like to measure and keep track of, but 
very likely we can't influence. We call these key result indicators. And in this case, there's a concept known as basis in the agriculture community. Uh, basis is the difference between the futures price that might be on the Chicago Commodity Exchange versus what a farmer can sell a bushel of soybeans at at his local elevator. There's, it's a very complex um, factor, uh, far out of the control of any one organization to impact basis, but it is something we want to keep track of and under, understand. This is level two of performance measurement. We measure and we manage KPIs. Understanding what the outcome is that we seek, we need to make sure we have a good feel for what are the constraints and opportunities related to that objective, and then validate. Do we, in fact, have the right KPIs? With the constraints and opportunities understood, now we can move into what is it that we're actually going to do, initiatives and projects. One thing that's been learned over the years is 80% of what soybean farmers need to know in order to maximize yield is already known. It's simply a matter of getting them to practice what we already know works. So the initiative related to technology transfer, and then there was a series of measures related to that initiative. And the idea is if we achieve the measures at the project initiative level, it'll contribute to, it'll move us from where we are and have a positive influence on the KPI. This is level three of performance measurement. At this level, at the project level, these are more leading indicators of what's likely to happen in the, f in the future. Our KPIs are more likely going to be lagging indicators, and that depends on what the objective is. You can still have leading indicators for KPIs. But very often, it's at the initiative level where we have the leads, and at the outcome level is where we have the lags. And there's a fourth level we won't talk about today, and that's day-to-day -day operations. There's measures there as well. But that's the levels of performance management. The seventh, I'm sorry, the sixth uh, competency is using a disciplined process for prioritizing initiatives. So, so strategic initiatives. We have an organization, and that organization has, uh, let's say, a goal, a couple of objectives that are represented here. And the, n the next issue is about, well, what strategic initiatives are we going to undertake, actually undertake, to reduce the performance gap in strategic objectives and help, and help us move towards uh, accomplishing the results that we seek? Well, one of the things I've noticed over time is that organizations too often try and do far too much with few too resources, and it lands up burning people out, <coughs> causing frustration, and undermines the effectiveness of managing strategic performance. So here, we're very big believers in coming up with the vital few cross-functional initiatives at the organization-wide level that's going to move us forward. So we need some way to narrow down, some type of prioritization filter that gives us a criterion by which we can look at initiative by initiative to see what, in fact, we should prioritize to move ourselves forward. Now, there's different ways, different techniques, different filters, if you will, to decide on uh, which initiatives to prioritize. Um, some of the options, you can use a weighted scoring approach. Uh, a two-by-two two matrix is what, what um, I really like. Uh, a, a paired comparison approach, and then oftentimes teams just want to come together and talk it out and reach consensus. But back to this two-by-two two matrix for a moment, because this works very well for us here. We use this approach of two-by-two, uh, two, four quadrants, with the, um, with the vertical um, dimension being the expected return on investment and benefit, and at the at the horizontal level, the strategic importance. The, what's most urgent? What's, what's um, most important to our, mi our mission and that we move ourselves forward? And clearly, we want to focus on initiatives that are going to have high impact on strategic importance and ROI. <coughs> if we get to the point where we have additional resources after we've undertaken those that fall in the upper left-hand corner, then we can be selective about doing something, well, it's mostly it's strategically important. I don't know about 
the ROI, or the ROI is strategic importance. So we want to be selective here and put these off until a later date. Now we have a, a tool for you that uh, that you'll download uh, after after the webinar, a two by two matrix tool that supports this. Let me give you a, an example of that. A couple of them actually. Uh, this is um, an organization that we work with. Uh, they have the four quadrants defined, and then you simply ask the team who's on the team to rate one by one the key initiatives, and then uh, add those up, divide it by the number of people who've responded, and plot them in this matrix. This is a, a different example, but, but basically the same idea. I think we did this for a, a trade association. Yes, so you, you see how that works, and we have this tool for you. But it's about, again, selecting the most important, strategically important, highest return on investment initiatives, and focus on those. Last, the seventh competency is, the use, is to use the strategy execution methodology to keep everybody focused and aligned and keep the team engaged. This is the hardest part. This is where the discipline is required. This is where a special effort needs to be made to, in, in, to invest in the infrastructure required to manage strategic performance. So why is it that this uh, having an organized approach is so very important? There's been tons and tons of things written about strategy and strategic planning, but there's over the years been very little work done related to strategy execution. Now that's starting to change now, but it has been the case over the past uh, 30 years. Larry Bossidy and Ram Sharan a few years ago wrote a book called Execution, The Discipline of Getting Things Done. And they were able to, uh, it, within the book, uh, answer this question, why is this so important? And they point out the strategies most often fail because they just aren't executed well. We don't have the skills, the capabilities, uh, the team, as I mentioned before, the strategy comes down from the top, people don't understand it. Uh, they're already completely booked, they don't have the time, they don't have the resource, and they fall apart. Too frequently, management doesn't recognize that they need to have folks on their team or a team, a, a culture that understands how important it is to focus on execution and building that discipline, investing in creating that skill and that knowledge base. Execution is absolutely integral to strategy. Strategic planning, that's the easy part. Execution is the hard part. And we need people with skills that have the capability to execute strategy. And it's not just the frontline staff. It's not the middle managers. Execution is the major job of the business leader. Formulating, implementing, evaluating control, being involved, being visible, and being a champion for the change that's, that's required to execute the strategy. And ultimately, and this comes back to Cotter again, the culture. We want to get to the point where everybody understands that we're about strategy execution. I've been doing a project for a large utility company the past year, and, and I can't tell you uh, how uh, impressed I've been on the fact that safety has been just at the heart of everything they do. It's permeated every employee in that organization. So it's that kind of idea. We want strategy execution to be something that everybody understands, practices, and we hold one another accountable. Now the way we get to execution is first and foremost we have to have alignment at the enterprise level, the organization level, whether it's a mission-driven organization, uh, whether it's a for-profit company, a mid-sized company, uh, whatever it might be, we, there needs to be a clear vision, as we've talked about before, a clear mission or purpose, a strategy, and those enterprise level objectives. And then at the department level, the business unit level, the program unit level, the program level, what are the objectives there that align with the enterprise level objectives? And then at the tier three level, we've referred to it as the team or individual level, what are my personal objectives? In order to have effective and efficient execution of strategy, we need light of sight from the individual to the unit to the enterprise.
when those are all aligned and they're consistent with the mission and vision, we have a great chance to be able to uh, have impact um, on performance. Now all of this takes information. And what I have here is I went ahead and did a flow chart of how information flows through a strategy management system. So at the, at the first level of performance management, the goal level, and then we identify those key drivers of success. Sometimes I call them key result areas, areas where we must generate results in order to achieve our goal. And those, those key drivers have strategies. We translate that into objectives. KPIs, we set targets, and now we're able to quanti quanti quantify and, re and report out how we're doing on some type of dashboard. We also need to think in terms of tactically, what are we going to do to achieve our objectives? What are the outputs? What are the outcomes? So here we get both quantitative and qualitative information, and we need that feedback loop that enables this system to work year in, year out quarter in, quarter out. Strategic learning is occurring. Level two and level three. So, coming to the end now. The way I've come to believe over time is you need an annual strategy management calendar that lays out the entire process that's supported by the leadership team. In today's session, I don't have time to get into the full calendar, but I did want to pull out this quarterly reporting idea, where on a quarterly basis, we collect data. Whoever owns an objective, they collect the information related to the KPIs and the initiatives, and how are we doing, and then analyze that information, uh, pull together some type of summary report, meet with the executive leadership team ahead of the governance meeting, to what is this telling us? What do we need to do? And whatever kind of governance you have, whether it's an ownership team or publicly traded or a nonprofit board, whatever it might be, bringing that information to them on a regular basis at the end of each quarter so adjustments can be made, refinement and execution can occur. Without having a good strategy management reporting calendar, it makes it very difficult to keep performance on track. Now, what I've just covered, um, this is what we refer to as our strategy management performance system. Uh, this is the program that we teach at George Washington University. It covers the five phases of strategy management, and then within each of those phases, the specific steps that are involved. Um, Sometimes we don't begin at the beginning, we don't only do part of this, but in terms of a robust strategy management performance system, this is how we think about uh, strategy management. Strategic thinking occurs at each of these levels, as we've talked about already, both externally and internally, we need to be thinking strategically. As we define our direction, as we put together the strategy plan, as we begin implementing it, and then over time controlling it. We'll be covering this information in more depth in our, in our, we have online programs, but what we'd like to highlight today is our boot camp. We're going to have a boot camp on July 11th to 15th here in Chicago. Uh, there's a discount code of $400 for anyone that's interested. And then we'll also be running the program again um, towards the late part of September. Okay, Joe, I think I've said what I needed to say, and uh, let's see what kind of questions we've got now. Okay, sounds very good, Randy, and we have a number of questions that came in uh, during your presentation. First of all, there was a couple questions along the lines of getting uh, copies of the slides of this presentation. There will be a uh, link uh, to a website so that you can view uh, the presentation, and uh, I think what I would suggest is that you contact uh, Randy directly uh, if you want to look at some uh, show versions of the presentation material. So let's get into the questions, Randy. The first one is, have you used metrics mapping or driver modeling to help identify what has the most measurable impact on strategic objectives? And if so, what is your opinion on using this method to bridge the measures with the objectives? 
the short answer is no. I've I've not done that. So I it's maybe you have, Joe. Have you done that sort of work? No, I have not done that either. So that's a, that's a very insightful question. Uh, yeah, metric. What's it called again? Metric. Uh, they were using metric mapping, metrics mapping, or driver modeling. Okay. Well, I happen to look into that. All right. Uh, next question, how can we implement the use of the balance scorecard to measure outcomes devoted uh, and involved in health systems in countries? Well, whether it's the balance scorecard or any other uh, framework, um, it starts by having a clear idea of the health care outcomes that we're trying to create. What is it? Uh, reducing childhood obesity, for example. We need to understand what are the specific outcomes that we seek and then work with our team to identify what are the appropriate measures, what are those indicators that will give us both an early indication, a leading indicator that would give us some idea of whether obesity is, is going down in children or not, as well as any lagging indicators. So it's the same approach. You start with the end in mind. What is the outcome that we seek? And then identify what, what measures we should be uh, following, tracking, reporting on to see if we're making progress, whether it's balanced scorecard or not. All right. Uh, next question. How does an operational unit keep the balanced scorecard front and center when involved and focused on the daily activities? It is absolutely vital that there is commitment from the top of the organization to create an expectation that if we're going to build a scorecard or any type of strategy management system that information is going to be reported on a regular basis and used to actually help shape and refine the strategy. If that commitment doesn't come from the top, if it's discounted by senior leaders, if it's not something that's embraced up inside the, down the organization where that culture is created, it, will, it won't last long. It'll just cave in on itself. Commitment from the top is absolutely vital. Again, that's why I'm stressing that first we have to have individual competencies. Small teams need to have competencies. That needs to be supported from the top. And then over time, it enables us to build those organizational capabilities where ultimately this gets embedded in the culture of the organization. Okay. Uh, next question. What comes first, mission or vision, and why? <laughs> the $64 <laughs> question. Uh, <laughs> this is something that we have debated in my office for years when we're, when we're, when we're writing the book and so forth. Um, I think of it this way. Um, I need to have a really clear idea of where we're trying to get to. And so I, I start with vision. Uh, I know plenty of folks. I think if Howard were on the call right now, he would say mission and what is the purpose. So ultimately, you could also make the argument that we should start with values. You know, we need to be clear about our values before we define our vision and our mission. So I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to this. It's more a matter of preference. But vision, mission, and values all need to be very clear from the beginning if we really want to ultimately measure performance. Okay. Next question. What one lesson learned do you have to motivate companies to adopt the balanced scorecard? What one message? Yeah, one lesson learned. Well, I, I'm, I'm reminded of an experience that I just had over the past six months. We work with a, a very large organization, uh, and in this case they did. Uh, their operating plan landed up becoming a balanced scorecard. Um, but what they didn't do, so they did the environmental assessment, they put together the clear vision, vision values, goals, uh, a balanced set of objectives, a strategy maps, came up with KPIs, had the cross-functional initiatives, began cascading it to Tier 2. But you know what they didn't do? They didn't lay the groundwork, as I said from the beginning, around communications and change management. And what started happening is they had all kinds of pushback from down inside the organization. It resulted in very significant turnover. 
and the CEO uh, has uh, subsequently resigned. So I, I come at strategy work uh, from a people perspective, uh, uh, let them have it your way kind of idea. You know, you have to give people input, you have to understand that change is going to be difficult, and we need to put in place the resources to help people change. If I, if I had to just hang my head on one thing, Joe, it would be to emphasize communications, change management from day one all the way through ongoing execution of the plan. All right, very good. Next question. When creating objectives, it's harder to focus and measure result as compared to measuring behavior. What is your advice to be sure that the measures are actually using is results focused? If, if the idea is that we want to move to increasing soybean yield, I mean, that's the ultimate outcome. We're going to go from 50 bushels of beans an acre to 80 bushels of beans an acre. That's the outcome. That's the intended result. Well, the way I see behavior and attitudes in that is more of an intermediate outcome. If we can um, measure adoption practices of something that's called no-till, if we see farmers that are beginning to adopt the no-till production practice, that's, uh, th that tells us there's an, there's an attitude that's changed, behaviors are changing, and we know from the research that's been done on no-till that ultimately that will lead to increased yield. So I would use attitude, behavioral changes as an intermediate measure, really looking to what, um, tell us how we're doing towards that ultimate outcome. All right, very good. Um, next question, could you mention some of the information systems you have worked with? Information systems that I have worked with. Well, I have worked with um, work that we've done here on our own. Uh, we've worked with uh, QuickScore. Uh, we've worked with Actuate over the years. Um, those are those are the primary tools that I've worked with so far. But there's a there's a host of tools out there, and the market is is consolidating. Um, so there are plenty of tools out there, but those are the ones I've worked with. Okay. Next question, my organization uses Porter's five forces. How can we incorporate the five forces into this? And have you ever used both or don't they support each other? Oh, they absolutely support each other. Um, when we're, Porter's work uh, in, from the 80s um, is still absolutely relevant. Um, sometimes it's criticized because markets don't grow forever and um, market share is not necessarily an indicator of profitability. The way I use Porter's Five Forces is uh, as an assessment tool. Early on in the process, trying to get a understand, an understanding of, of the competitive environment that they operate within. So it's, a, it's helpful at that level. It's also when doing the environmental assessment, as I mentioned before, looking at the opportunities and threats. That's a great time to about pull out Porter's Five Forces uh, as a way to do some analysis of the environment. Uh, the strategy map from Blue Ocean Strategy is, a, is another tool. I mean, if we're, we're in a situation with head-to-head -head competition, kind of the red ocean, I'd use Porter. If we're trying to create uncontested market space and create new value, then I'd use the strategy map from Blue Ocean. Okay. Very good. Let's, next question. Do you think that using the balanced scorecard in a government or nonprofit setting looks differently than using it in for-profit industries? If so, how? Well, oh, again, similar but different. In, in a for-profit setting, the ultimate outcome is the, the financial performance, the profitability, uh, increasing shareholder value. Uh, that, that's not the same thing in a government agency or a mission-driven organization when it's all about uh, the customer. So in a situation like that, uh, our recommendation is that you reverse the two perspectives and have customer at the top and financial being an enabler. So learning and growth, internal, customer, financial, and for-profit in a mission-driven organization, that learning and growth, internal, financial, and then customer. So reverse the two perspectives. Okay. 
The cause and effect mapping is equally valid. The process to develop indicators and everything else we've been talking about is the same. It's simply just reversing those, those two perspectives. Okay. Uh, next question. Based on your seven competencies, uh, first question is, have you ever run into a client firm that absolutely has had every one of the competencies at its highest level? And if not, which one or two or three, whatever number, uh, seems to be missing most of the time? Um, that's a great question. Um, I, 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 <laughs> how do I say this? Um, I find executive leadership teams oftentimes too anxious to get to what is it we're going to do by when and what it's going to cost, and they don't take the time to do the external assessment, to really understand the external environment, to do the work with the key stakeholders, uh, to really figure out what their core competency is, and focus on that. I mean, if you just jump all over that, jump over that and go right to what's our vision, uh, you know, it's not grounded. It's not grounded in a common understanding of what we're trying to do. So that would be the first one that I, that I would point out. The second one I already mentioned was trying to do too much with too little resource. Uh, even the U.S. military has limited resources these days. Used to, they could do any darn thing they want. Well, they can't anymore. We all are faced with limited time, people, energy, and it's better to narrow down and drop, drop some of those things that others may have um, just fallen in love with that are not driving results. So doing fewer things better versus um, a real portfolio of everything we should do. That would be the second one I'd mention. Okay. Uh, next question. What is the best way to handle change management? Please share some success stories. Is it, too, uh, is it to do with the management styles? It has everything to do with the leaders of the organization embracing the idea that strategy is about change and people generally don't like change. So it requires investing in the communications uh, up front, letting people know that, hey, we're moving into updating our strategy. Uh, we're going to keep you informed along the way of what's taking place. We're going to have a cross-functional team that's going to give input into it. We're going to share the environmental assessment with you. We're going to make sure you understand how we prioritize what we did and what we decided not to do. So it's, uh, it's bringing that idea in from the beginning. Uh, I, I mentioned before I'm working with a large uh, automotive um, company now that uh, recognizes that um, the world is changing around them, especially on the technology level. So parallel to the strategy effort that I'm leading, there's a communications firm that's working with them in order to help the field staff uh, uh, process uh, what we're learning along the way uh, and that will ultimately lay the groundwork for helping their dealer network uh, understand some of the changes they need to make in order to remain um, competitive in the future. But if, 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 the, if the top people don't value and appreciate the need for investment in communication change management planning, it's just a, a sea of frustration that follows. All right. Um, next question. Uh, what do you see as some of the implementation failures over the, the course of your experiences uh, doing strategic plans or balanced scorecard strategies? Well, in mission-driven organization, uh, I'd point to roles and responsibilities, uh, have the governance of the organization, understanding what their role and responsibility is in the strategy management process, and uh, being able to, you know, avoid micromanaging um, the team and the, the, gov the staff of the organization. Um, you know, they respect the governance. So understanding roles and responsibilities is something I see where a lot of friction occurs with mission-driven organizations. Um, okay, I lost my thought. Um, implementation failures was the root of the question. An accountability model. Okay. Having clear account, thank you, Joe. That's what happens when you get my age. Um, 
an accountability model where there's an owner of every objective. There is someone who owns that objective. There is an owner of, of initiatives. Uh, there's a, a, an owner who keeps track of the KPIs and reports on them. Uh, that it's linked into some reporting calendar where everybody knows this is what my responsibility is. Because if the, if, if the, the information isn't available when leaders have to make decisions, I mean, what's the point? So having a clear accountability model is, uh, is what I'd point to. And uh, the last question is, uh, I've been tasked by senior management to start to implement a strategic planning process at our organization, but I'm getting a clear signal that it's just a task on the senior management's checklist, and there's not much evidence of continued support for it even once it's built. What should I do? Stop! Don't proceed. Okay. I mean that very, I mean that very um, sincerely. Uh, if, if the executive leaders of the organization are not behind it, and you've got a small group that's passionate about it, uh, it's going to lead to frustration. It's going to lead to conflict. In, in that situation, I would focus more at a small group level. Um, building individual competencies that on a smaller scale, demonstrating the value of it. Um, but until the leaders come to embrace it, uh, it's a formula for failure and frustration and people losing their job when we really try and push strategy on people who don't want to do it, who don't want to be held accountable. Um, so you have to be careful. Okay. All right. Uh, that uh, ends the question listings, uh, Randy. Uh, if anyone has any uh, further questions, please contact uh, the uh, Strategy Management Group or Randy or the Balanced Scorecard Institute. We'll make sure that those questions get addressed and uh, you will get a link uh, at the conclusion uh, of this of the uh, webinar. And uh, Randy, excellent uh, presentation and um, I think uh, we're pretty much toward the end here. Well, just one more thing. Whoever uh, posed the question about metric mapping and driver modeling, I'm looking forward to um, looking into that and if you reach out to me I'll share with you what I learned. Excellent. Thanks that Randy's uh, uh, email address is on the screen uh, now if you want to make note of it and um, but uh, we appreciate your time and your, your uh, attention for today's uh, webinar. Randy thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs>